So should we get started? Okay, I guess we're getting started. So hello, everyone. Welcome to DEF CON at the lovely Las Vegas Convention Center. Very fabulous new venue that we're all learning to deal with. Uh, first off, can folks who are sitting in the back hear me? Because I know it's a pretty uh, difficult room. So there's plenty of space up here. Feel free to move forward or whatever. The screens are also a little tiny if you're sitting in the back. Trust me, I don't bite. and I don't think anyone else here does either. But what we'll talk about today is getting into the risk and reward of distributed industrial control systems. Uh, first, who am I? My name is Joe Slowick. I currently do a bunch of things over at the MITRE Corporation, like leading up some of the functions within Attack and doing critical infrastructure research. And I've done a bunch of things previously, but no one gives a crap about me. We're here to talk about industrial control systems and how these things are increasingly interconnected and exposed. So our agenda is we're going to talk about what distributed operations mean and how this works to extend the attack surface of um, industrial assets. We'll look at this from the perspective of what opportunities this affords adversaries, and then talk about some risks and considerations and what we can meaningfully do about this new interconnected, networked, and exposed landscape that we're dealing with for fairly important things like critical infrastructure operations. So first, distributed industrial operations. What does that actually mean? Well, if you talk to a lot of people that don't have a, a whole lot of experience or have a lot of assumptions around what industrial environments look like, you would get a picture such as what I hope is up on the screen right now, because I know there's been some issues, um, that there is an air gap that exists segmenting networks quite thoroughly uh, between a internet connected environment and a plant environment which has no external connectivity whatsoever. That may still be the case in certain areas, like nuclear generation, for example, but has largely never really been the case uh, in many environments and certainly isn't the case anymore for the majority of operations that exist. Instead, we're all living in a networked world right now where we're increasingly seeing systems that you would normally assume would be walled off from the rest of the world are connected and need to be connected to uh, systems that need to talk to something external to your environment. There is a measure of internet connectivity involved. It can be controlled, limited. You can talk about things like data diodes and other sorts of technologies. But generally speaking, data needs to get in and some data is going to need to get out. So in looking at this, in legacy environments, we're really talking about operations and control are co-located. So one of the things that enabled that air gap to exist is that you had your operators and the physical equipment they were dealing with were co-located at the same physical site where plant networks start at, stop at the physical boundary of the facility. So you didn't have to worry about networking these things. However, more modern operations, if we're talking about things like wind farms, pipelines, increasingly ambitious mining operations, or offshore oil and gas exploration, we're really talking about controlling systems that now extend in geographically dispersed ways where we have to distribute operations and a lack of manning, both because it's very difficult to try to staff every single compressor station along a pipeline or every single wind farm that exists in western Kansas or something along those lines, that we need remote operations control, monitoring, etc. to make these things happen. So this isn't just a cost-saving mechanism at this point, it's a necessity based upon how we have built out infrastructure and how um, very vital aspects of the current critical infrastructure mix function. Now, this isn't especially new. So those of you who are familiar with the electric um, operations and similar, like, well, we've had energy management systems, transmission management systems and similar that have uh, centralized management of fairly complex and geographically distributed systems for quite some time and has operated in a fairly analog fashion in a number of cases as well. So even getting outside of digital uh, technologies. So we've been doing bits of this for quite some time and do it rather well in certain cases uh, too. But what we're really looking at now is a radicalization of how this connectivity works because now we're getting away from things like hardline connectivity to all of these assets uh, or using things like you know telephone lines or buried fiber and getting into an increasingly wireless ecosystem to facilitate this communication where we're relying upon things like satellite communications, 5G, 4G networks, and similar to make this happen, which introduce some interesting security repercussions to how this communication is taking place. So what we're looking at is that, yes, we've done some of this remote management historically, but now we're doing it in a much more prevalent and in a much more um, potentially insecure or attack surface uh, magnifying way where economics, efficiency, and just the way that we operate have driven unmanned and remote operations in a number of sectors. Technology advances, however, are permitting easier connectivity with remote assets. Having a classic VSAT, very small aperture terminal, 
10 or 20 years ago for a remote mining site is like trying to suck a grape through, through a straw when it comes to bandwidth and connectivity, whereas now increases in tech, advances in technology, the expansion of satellite constellations and so forth have dramatically increased the bandwidth available for this uh, these type of networks and expanded the scope of what we can reasonably expect to do with these sorts of control systems. And furthermore, industry trends like distributed energy resources, as well as things like vendor remote telemetry and remote preventative maintenance and so forth, are accelerating these trends by requiring that asset owners increasingly allow for connectivity to their industrial assets. So now we're getting into things like having assets or at least elements of assets connected to, if not residing, in cloud-based instances, which dramatically uh, changes what the um, ideas of segmentation look like in terms of how these environments can operate. So in looking at our options for remote connectivity, we certainly have some traditional items that are out there like our plain old telephone system, dedicated fiber, or you know, fairly uncontroversial and uh, historical in nature. But now we're really talking about expanding the use of cellular modems, which have also been around for quite some time, uh, getting into increased ad adoption of satellite systems for enabling these uh, systems to talk to one another, and using a variety of 5G and wireless technologies to facilitate this sort of communication. So what does this mean? Well, it has lots of operational uh, elements to it in terms of how industrial asset management, monitoring, and control function, but also adversaries are involved in these conversations as well, because we're also talking about dramatic changes to what the attack surface looks like for these types of resources. So when looking at always online industrial systems, we're really expanding scope out so that if we're talking about a distributed satellite communication network where you have communications bouncing to an overhead asset and then going to a ground communication center, that you have a variety of wired and wireless links that become involved in connecting various assets up and multiple potential touch points to get into and interact with that network. Similarly, for 5G or other sorts of wireless terrestrial networks, we're talking about mesh networks of multiple devices that can talk to one another and communicate in a variety of ways that introduce a very interesting landscape in terms of who can talk to whom and how you control the directionality of such communication. But also we're talking about systems where we're rapidly integrating vendors being able to consistently monitor and potentially even interact with their environments as well, such as the uh, GE Atlanta data highway for managing um, uh, uh, generating assets produced by that company. We're seeing this across a variety of vendors where you have assets tied to vendor management and monitoring for preventative maintenance, remote management, uh, and just big data analytics and so forth to fuel product development and product support. So in looking at these uh, connectivity functions and dependencies, there's certainly the remote access and maintenance aspect of things of how do you operate power plants that are spread out over a wide geographic area and control them in a way that makes sense, uh, that remote control and operations aspect, but also the telemetry and health check aspect of how do I make sure things are running and running as I want them to, uh, but also getting into very commercial aspects like licensing and use monitoring. Are you operating your equipment in line with the contract that you signed and using it within the boundaries of what it is that we agreed to commercially. Uh, and finally, we get system of system items as well, such as coordination, balancing, and management of wider scope systems, whether we're talking about things like maintaining frequency phase, et cetera, for the overall electric system or managing pipelines to ensure that they are adequately pressurized along their entire length to allow for product delivery um, across their entire network. So what this means is that as we've started expanding these sorts of functionalities and exposing these items through wireless and other means, it's providing opportunities for adversaries to interact with these elements in ways that didn't really exist previously. So what does that look like? Well, what it looks like is that we have distributed overlapping communications that are really good for efficient, reasonably reliable if there are fail safes and uh, backups involved in how these are put together. But in doing so, we've also expanded the attack surface in such a ma manner that it's no longer about accessing the external facing IT or classic business network assets of an industrial asset owner and operator, and then digging your way through the network to get into the industrial environment through several lateral movement hops and so forth. But instead, I may be able to hit those assets directly, either through a wireless communication mechanism or because the way in which these assets are networked overall allows me to access the provider in such a way that I can now start delivering payloads directly to the critical assets within the environment, or at least the networking assets that 
that are facilitating the, the connectivity of those assets to the wider environment. And we're going to look at an example of that here in just one slide. Um, but the thing is, is that we're really talking about expanding the opportunities of adversaries to interact via these new communication mechanisms in a distributed environment that increases the opportunities for adversaries to uh, interfere with, inject into, or otherwise um, send commands to these sorts of assets for a variety of potential reasons. So what does this look like in practice? Well, we have one really interesting example from a couple of years ago. For those who were following the news at the time, at the very start of the current phase of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was a interruption to the KASAT uh, network owned by Viasat, managed by a subsidiary, by a contracting entity that resulted not just in a disruption of communication for Ukrainian military operations that was using the KASAT net network, but also resulted in a significant outage for wind turbines manufactured by a German company called Entercon, where essentially a loss of view and debatably a loss of control um, situation manifested because the terminals, the modems that were being used to connect these wind farm systems to remote control and management systems were bricked by a family of malware uh, labeled by Sentinel-1 researchers as acid rain. While it was not intentional, or we at least do not think that it was intentional in this event that uh, taking out this wind generation was purposeful, still in attacking the KASAT network through the delivery of the push of basically a malicious uh, software payload to customer terminals within the overall environment, they were able to knock offline a variety of generating assets. Now, certainly, if you're talking about remote wind, and et cetera, there are fail safes that step into play in order to cause these things to at least fail safely, fail relatively securely. But we're still talking about placing these assets into a state where they're no longer able to sync effectively with the broader environment uh, and no longer able to effectively ma manage them as we would if that connectivity existed as it was intended to do so. So certainly putting a fairly interesting element and an increasingly important element of our generating mix at risk when we start talking about things like distributed wind, distributed solar, uh, and even getting into things like rooftop solar, et cetera, which may rely upon wireless communication mechanisms and the use of uh, various networking devices and so forth that have vulnerabilities in them or have the possibility of a acid rain like scenario where we could potentially push a malicious payload via access to some other element within the overall network to cause widespread impacts and outages across all the interlinked devices. Uh, we also have the Colonial Pipeline incident. I put an asterisk on this because this really was more of a proof of concept in terms of what may have occurred as opposed to what actually occurred. So for Colonial Pipeline, um, Colonial Pipeline basically shut their own operations down because they lacked the visibility and the confidence in saying that they were able to run a effective network that was also that could be remain safe, but also could track things like product delivery as a result of a ransomware incident. But out of the Colonial Pipeline event, you saw a number of commentators, I'll use that word pejoratively, that ask questions about, well, why not just air gap everything? It's like, it's a couple thousand mile pipeline. It's only got like seven or eight compressor stations and maybe a dozen PLCs, right? How hard could that be to network all that together with heart, with you know buried fiber? The answer to that is that it's not easy. And while Colonial Pipeline resulted uh, uh, from an impact on the business network, it doesn't take a whole lot to expand our conception of what a pipeline incident might look like to being able to interact with compressor stations that are remote, often unmanned um, and relying upon increasingly wireless communications, although there are still hardwired communications in play, to allow for interaction with how that pipeline functions to induce conditions like a loss of view because you're no longer able to communicate with a specific compressor station. Depending on how things work, and this gets a little bit more interesting in terms of what possibilities are available, you could, with sufficient access and poor segmentation and so forth, be able to inject controls into a legitimate way of operating and maintaining that pipeline to start inducing potential catastrophic events like an overpressure or underpressure situation that would result in pipeline disruption. Not really easy, and it's debatable how practical that would be for an adversary to do, but if we're exposing control systems that relate to the fundamental operation of these assets, then especially if those controls are going over the air in an unencrypted way that aren't using proper checksums to validate commands and controls that are going over that environment, the possibilities for replaying, capturing, or potentially modifying control system logic as it moves over unsecure lines or over the air starts becoming a very interesting scenario for how to uh, achieve achieve far more lasting and concerning effects than what we saw with the ransomware incident a few years ago.
So in looking over all at this, we see that there's a variety of diverse opportunities that are available for adversaries in terms of their ability to control or to interact with uh, critical infrastructure elements enabled by a increasingly remote perspective on how these systems are managed and uh, maintained. So certainly there are IT focused disruption uh, mechanisms that can take place against control centers, which can be very interesting because rather than having say control centers distributed among various assets, now I have one centralized control and management station sitting in Spain, if I'm Siemens Gamisa or something like that, or one centralized control station uh, located elsewhere that the vendor is managing in order to maintain a wind farm or a fleet of wind farms, that if that gets taken out through ransomware, something deliberate and more malicious, etc., can I still operate all those facilities in a safe and effective manner that allows for them to continue to be part of the overall energy mix? But also we have more uh, end state or a field uh, device uh, potential scenarios that come from subversion or injection into these communication environments. So here we're talking about possibilities like, well, looking at the intercon scenario where I can deliberate, uh, specifically and deliberately take out the communication devices that tie these systems back into centralized monitoring and uh, control or like the a theoretical pipeline attack scenario, leverage my ability to inject into insecure communication streams to send rogue commands, similar to what we see, ooh, there's a microphone, uh, similar to what we see like the using of a tool like <laughs> Frosty Goop, which was in the news a few weeks ago in terms of injecting uh, Modbus communication logic in order to have effects on central heating in Ukraine, but something like that taking place without having the IT intrusion, but rather based off of the ability to interact directly with control systems over a wireless communication link that doesn't involve breaching another aspect of the air of the asset owners network or may involve breaching the contracting entity that's providing that communication infrastructure in order to then deliver that follow on effect to the actual industrial assets that are interesting. Either way, we look at these two different sides of the equation between going after the centralized control and management, the single points of failure for how these networks are operated in many ways, which is why there are typically very well secured. If you've gone to a electric utilities EMS or transmission management system, you know, where it's physically located, there is significant physical security. These are crown jewel assets for IT security. They're not exactly poorly defended, but if we start talking one layer up from the actual management and maintenance, that if you can't get commands out from that center, from those consoles, out to the devices in the field that you're trying to maintain and manage, things can go south very quickly and result in systems that, uh, if they don't have the proper resilience and uh, failovers in place, can, be, can start entering into very unsafe and uncertain states fairly quickly. So in looking at these uh, considerations, the main worry that I have at least, and that we're starting to see in some of these techno uh, technologies and implementations is that in the drive for efficiency, like, oh, well, we could use the Starlink cost constellation and just put little satellite uh, receivers or whatever at all of our end stations. And we have connectivity for relatively low cost uh, with fairly good bandwidth that we can tie all these it items together. That's true, but if that constellation should go down or if there is a malicious update that's pushed to Starlink terminals or some other scenario manifests, how do we then ensure that that system can maintain operational and how long do we have until that system needs to switch into a, an emergency state to ensure the continued viable operation of critical infrastructure assets like electricity generation, pipeline operations, uh, remote mining operations, uh, offshore oil and gas exploration and drilling, et cetera. So the result is that the possibilities emerge for severing or uh, degrading active control mechanisms in these sorts of environments that can place these ecosystems at risk. This gets us into a situation where if you're familiar with ICS for attack, the framework uh, for mapping out potential adversary opportunities for interacting with industrial assets, that we can start seeing the possibilities emerge for inducing a loss of view, the ability to monitor and extract information from these environments for the purpose of determining are they operating in the way that we want them to? And, um, you know, are they doing their job safely, efficiently, et cetera, but also potentially and more worryingly a loss of control where we get into a scenario, not whether I can start a process, but rather can I stop it if that process starts deviating from uh, safe or desirable uh, parameters for its overall functionality. So in looking at this, what risks are we talking about and what considerations are involved in this discussion? 
Well, first, you know, we can uh, make the argument, well, why not just turn back the clock? And I've seen people say this, uh, you know, why not just air gap all the important control systems? Well, that'd be really hard, really expensive. And I don't think anyone really expects that we could realistically do this at this point. Um, that ship has sailed and it probably sailed a very, very long time ago. And looking at things like the type of energy mix that we need for the future, as well as increasingly ambitious things like oil and gas exploration and mining operations, we're going to need these sorts of um, non-wired over the air and distributed communication environments to tie all these assets into centralized data retrieval, monitoring, maintenance, and control in order for them to be effective. So we're not able to turn back the clock. We can't just say, why are all the things together very, you know, 7,000 kilometers worth of dedicated fiber to tie all these things together is just not a realistic option at this point, unless everyone's willing to pay a lot more for a lot of these services that are uh, enabled by the various infrastructure sectors. So instead, we need to acknowledge reality that remote connectivity and especially management of uh, critical assets is a fact of existence right now. However, in doing so, that doesn't mean that we just need to throw our hands up and say, well, okay, I accept the risk and bad things are going to happen. There are ways that we can and must do these sorts of items safely, securely, but also redundantly to ensure that we have the sort of um, resiliency built in to allow these operations to continue. So in a very simplified way, we can break this down in terms of OT remote operations between security considerations and reliability considerations. From a security standpoint, you know, availability, if we talk our classic confidentiality, integrity, availability triad, we're not going to really worry about availability right now. We're going to assume availability has to be there and we're going to work our damnedest to ensure it. And that's where is where reliability comes into play. But for ComSec or communication security considerations, we're really talking about ensuring the integrity of those communications, uh, which can be as simple as ensuring that we're doing a robust uh, checksums applied to controls that are communicated over insecure networks. Um, you know, if we're talking about a satellite downlink or wireless communications, some of these links, as you can probably tell from other talks that have, that have taken place at DEF CON's past and present, uh, have emphasized the insecurity of some of these links and how they can be both eavesdropped upon as well as potentially injected into or otherwise subverted for malicious purposes. So being able to verify the integrity of commands that are sent over these links is vital and something that we need to start pursuing or layering on top of existing industrial uh, control protocols and similar to make that happen. Confidentiality may be part of this. Uh, you could argue, well, why not just encrypt all of these items? That might work. Uh, there is debate as to how useful or how effective that would be because encryption adds overhead and potential latency in terms of how these commands get passed and processed. And as we start talking about pretty thin pipes like remote satellite communication links and so forth uh, and potential latency issues that surround that, it might not be desirable. But it is something that, especially when it comes to OT or ICS related protocols, that needs to be considered more strongly instead of just throwing up our hands in the air and saying, well, this is hard, so let's not do it. From a reliability standpoint, yes, it is cheap and easy just to try to wire things together with commercial satellite modems and so forth and call it good. But if we're talking about critical assets that feed into national critical infrastructure, we need to have something more or build in the correct ways of ensuring those operations can be sustained in a challenging environment, whether that be because a satellite constellation gets knocked out by an anti-satellite missile or something along those lines or similar wild scenarios, or something like we saw with the KASAT event with the distributed denial of service uh, mechanism that was used in parallel with the acid rain wiper that was causing significant degradation to that network. How do we operate in a way that if this link is removed, that we have a backup link or a way of uh, securely and safely winding down operations until those links can be restored? That's going to cost a little bit of money, unfortunately, but if we want to reap the rewards of uh, having the flexibility created by these sorts of environments, we need to ensure that we're also doing so in a way that is maintainable and sustainable in realistic fashion. It also means, and this is where we come to DEF CON and most of the audience here, offensive security testing has a role to play here. Validating communications and how they work, especially from an adversary's mindset and when the eyes of disruption is critical, which means offensive testing, which could be anything from tabletop exercises that run through like, oh, wait, if that goes away, what do we actually do to validating that certain networks can be reached or interacted with through over the air links and thus demonstrating risk to decision makers that, oh, wait a minute, this is not a notional problem, but actually can manifest 
can allow asset owners to deploy well, evaluating what risk propositions are available. And this gets into a variety of disciplines that become very interesting very quickly in terms of what we can do to test and validate how these networks are deployed and how they function. In terms of additional considerations, there are other things that we need to worry about, and we only have a short period of time here, uh, but I'll have a link to some resources if you want to look a little bit further, uh, that we do have the possibility of physical attacks and disruptions on remote links, uh, insecure protocols that are used over the air, which I talked about a little bit already, as well as latency and observability concerns that come about with communications that start getting pushed into more extreme and more interesting uh, arenas. But overall, uh, the central point or thesis behind this is that we're in a state where we've extended attack surface but haven't really validated how we will operate securely and safely in that new environment as effectively as I think that we should. And these are considerations that asset owners need to keep in mind. So I don't think we have much time for questions, but before I get back to that slide, if anyone wants to snap a link, uh, picture of this or these slides will be available on the media server, I believe. Just a couple of links to articles and some of the things I talked about. But also, if you're really interested in a deep dive into one particular event on this, I'll be presenting at length, including a very lengthy paper, at the Virus Bulletin Conference later this year on the KASAT incident. That'll get published in October, so bookmark this if you're interested and really want to explore the nuts and bolts of what not just an attack scenario looks like in this regard, but also what defensive options exist when it comes to doing this sort of activity. Uh, so that's forthcoming, and you know certainly look out for that if you are interested. Otherwise, uh, there's my information, so happy to answer questions. I know we got a quick turnaround time here, so I will hang out probably in the back of the room so that our next speaker can get ready. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good to go. Thanks everyone for hanging out.